Recently, Laura Flanders' show guest host Pamela Brown had a chance to speak to author and Harvard Law professor Yochai Benkler about Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and profit. Here's that interview. Will the users of Facebook ever own Facebook? My name is Pam Brown, and I'm sitting in today for Laura Flanders. Yohai Benkler, author of The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom, Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School, and faculty co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, is here today to talk about the history of peer production on the internet and about the possibility of massively popular and user-owned online platforms. Thank you so much for joining us, Yoshai. I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start with something very basic. What is peer production? Peer production is the way in which people work together to produce Wikipedia. It's the way in which people work together to produce the free software that most of the services on the internet run, the basic web servers, the basic script. It basically means that sometimes 10, sometimes 10,000 people come together and work on producing something without having anyone own it without having anyone direct anyone else in terms of what to do, just through social collaboration. And so doesn't that, all, doesn't that happen very regularly in our society as it stands? What's different about what we've seen since the advent of the internet with, with these kinds of peer production? So we've always had social production. People have been telling each other stories and sharing the news, but that didn't compete with the New York Times. People have been singing together, but that didn't compete with the industries. People have been helping each other move, but that didn't compete with the uh, moving industry. What happened in the networked economy was that um, for the first time really since the Industrial Revolution, the most important resources in society were widely distributed in the population. Computers, sensors, storage, but also insight, creativity, availability. So people were doing things they'd always done socially together in ways that were important for them socially, but peripheral to the economy of the 20th century. And now it moved from the periphery of the economy to the center of the economy. This was the big transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so as it's moved from the periphery to the center, have, ha, does that lead us to think that people may have more meaningful work, that wealth in our economy might be spread <coughs> more equitably? It seems, on the other hand, that that has not been the case. So this is the really critical question. What peer production, what work in the commons of the internet has taught us is that it is possible, if we organize our work correctly, to do things differently, to do things in a much more democratic and collaborative way. But at no point was it reasonable to think that the internet would force it to happen this way. What happened was that in the 20th century, we had a small number of companies controlling a lot of production. And in the early 21st century, it looked like things were opening up. It looked like cooperation was replacing. But instead, what we've actually seen is a small number of companies coming into this widely shared internet commons and layering over some platforms that are able to extract that value for a small number of shareholders. That's the big challenge. Is something like that Facebook, for example, or Uber, or Airbnb? Facebook is the perfect early example. Google is also a perfect <laughs> early example. I think Uber and Airbnb are really important to talk about, but they're even a newer generation. Hmm. If you look at the first generation, at Facebook, for example, what you have is people are producing the value. They share their social relations, they share their conversations, people are producing the value. But the one company that has actually provided the platform has collected the most important value, as it were, which is the attention and the data, and converted it into a network that now actually allows them to manipulate the users in order to sell them to advertisers. Here, advertising revenue has really been the core source of um, uh, problems or, or risk because if all of these billions of users were paying even a very small amount, um, 
the company could afford essentially not to sell their data, not to control their data. If the users all owned it and paid a membership fee of a dollar a month, you'd have an enormously productive uh, uh, company, or obviously different in different countries. But instead, what you have is that it's actually the commons. The fact that everybody shares their data creates a new, um, uh, a new place for some companies to mine. And just as with the commons of the air and the pollution mm -hmm. of the 19th and 20th century, where a small number of companies use the commons in ways that increase their wealth, but at the expense of shared culture, data is in some sense today's pollution. It takes the commons of social relations, extracts value from it, but captures and eliminates privacy and creates a surveillance society that is completely new to us. That's at least the risk. So is, is my posting on Facebook a form of labor in that context? I don't think that it's a form of labor. It's a form of being. It's a form of social relations. The problem here, unlike with Uber or TaskRabbit, the problem here is not extracting the value of your labor, because I think what you do on Facebook is much more akin to what you did in leisure. It's the fact that you're producing something that has value, and in the process of giving you the ability to do it, the company is capturing the value in a way that doesn't respect what you brought into it, which is your social relations, your sense of identity and privacy, and instead commodifies everything. It's more of an extraction and mining industry than it mm -hmm. is a, a labor extraction company. That makes it very different from some of the companies that have been called sharing economy, which are really much more on-demand uh, economy, like Uber. Yeah, let's go a little <coughs> bit into, into understanding Uber, for example. So many New Yorkers have um, become addicted to using Uber to get everywhere, because any time you go on the app, you can see lots of cars, they even offer ride sharing now. What is different about Uber than Facebook? And how is Uber different from, for example, just our regular yellow taxis that we're so familiar with here? So Uber shares some of the basic economics of early peer production in terms of very low transactions costs of bringing, that is to say, it costs very little <coughs> money to get people to agree on what to do. That was very important for people basically not having to pay anything to agree to work on Wikipedia. But then they were doing it socially and they were doing it for the social good. Here, you basically, Uber has found a way to use the same economics that allowed those open collaboration platforms to instead basically say, I want to work for an hour here, I want to work for eight hours there, bring these people together and get them to talk to the people who uh, want to uh, uh, get a ride. The problem is that Uber is in many senses free riding on a whole set of social platforms and social capabilities that public activity is offering without actually giving back. So you start with the roads. You move on to the simple thing. If a person doesn't pay, so taxis are common carriers. They're essentially public transportation, even though they're for their individuals. And the whole point of creating taxis as common carriers was in order to overcome some of the problems you saw in early um, uh, markets where anybody could carry anything else. And you had problems with security, and you had problems with proper insurance, and you had problems with actually contributing back to building the infrastructure uh, through a form of taxation on the ride. And Uber is trying to present itself, because it's, quote, just a platform, just an app, as though it's not really providing the service. So it's claiming not to be a common carrier, when in fact what it's doing is directly competing with a common carrier. Now, common carriers, nobody is going to sit around and say the taxi industry is the most efficient industry there ever was. Nobody is going to say that being a taxi driver is the most stable job ever. So the point is not to be utopian about how wonderful the old taxis are but also not to be utopian about how wonderful Uber is. So I guess what I want to think about is the possibility that um, peer production of this kind could be something that's positive, economically, socially, help with inequality, um, or help diminish inequality. How can that actually happen now? 
One of the most exciting developments in the past year or year and a half has been the increasing call in a variety of uh, sectors for, cooperative, for cooperativism. Uh, the increasing call to build systems that would replicate some of the conveniences uh, and efficiencies of the on-demand economy, but using platforms where users share the ownership and the governance and the management of the platform rather than simply uh, leaving them to investor-owned firms. Um, cooperatives have a very long tradition. They've been around for over 100 years. Um, they work in some sectors and in some industries, but not in others. Where they have worked, they've generally provided more stable income, though not necessarily higher, mm. uh, less uh, susceptibility to volatility. In other words, people's income was more stable. After the recession in many worker co-ops, instead of people being laid off, everybody took a bit of a pay cut and <laughs> waited until things got better. So even if workers weren't getting better salaries, there was more stability. The other thing is there's a very strong ethical commitment to people participating, people participating in the governance, controlling their everyday work. So the critically exciting new direction is to take some of these basic economies that have worked for these investor-owned startups, which actually mean that it's relatively inexpensive to build such a platform, and translate what we learned from peer production in Wikipedia um, and free software into the fact that people can organize themselves on this shared platform. If we can build that, what we've learned historically is that cooperatives emerge and can compete in markets, but they don't dominate a market. So you need to want to do it, you need to build it, and if you build it, it can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily knock the competition out of the market, but it also won't die. But if you build it, then you have a real opportunity for all of those peoples, whether they're TaskRabbit, whether they're Instacart, whether they're Uber, to be their own managers, to govern themselves, and to govern themselves in such a way that assures a security of income that shares the risk instead of simply extracting the value for the few and externalizing all of the risk onto the actual workers and providers. On the other <clears> hand, <throat> though, isn't there a risk inherent to having uh, individuals take on full responsibility for all of their labor? For example, workers over the course of the last 150 years have really been fighting for better work conditions, shorter hours, um, safer conditions, things of this nature. When you, uh, when people come together in a sharing environment that now is economically productive, won't some of those uh, protections that workers fought for so long for go, go away? So it's important to recognize what the reality is against which this is developing. Contingent work didn't, wasn't invented by the on-demand economy. Contingent work has been a steady process since the 60s and 70s of companies like what started out as Kelly Girls, things like Manpower, teaching corporate management that they could rely on workers who were actually not like the classical worker in the firm with all of those protections. So we have seen an erosion of this ideal model of work in the firm for 40 years now. It's continuously getting worse, and it is one of the main drivers of the fact that income of middle-wage Americans has been stagnating since 1980. Literally stagnating since 1980 and contingent work is part of it. So the question of online cooperativism now is not relative to the 1950s and 60s idealized family wage. It's the reality of increased contingency in multiple sectors. The question then becomes, can cooperatives allow workers to be each other's mutual assurance company? To essentially say, we share the work we share the risk, we spread it among all of us, so that part of what we're doing together is actually trying to recreate through our own mutual insurance that is this cooperative, 
recreate some of the stability, recreate some of the dignity that was historically associated with lifetime employment in a firm, but with the flexibility of these more fluid network environments. Mm -hmm. And so in, in your thinking about the future, in the positive vision, how would cooperatives form in such a way that they are inclusive versus, in a sense, exclusive? It doesn't sound like you're arguing for cooperatives only. You're saying that co cooperatives could coexist with other kinds of more traditional companies. So how do, you, how do you think that this can play out? It seems to me that there would be natural forms of solidarity that, that would say, wow, I trust you, but I don't trust you. So how do you think that within this model for cooperatives, which seems to present a more positive uh, future, particularly around contingent labor, how would, how would this issue be addressed? I think that's a major challenge, and I'm not at all convinced that mm -hmm. it can be solved. Mm. Um, I think that's one of the major risks of this cooperative model. Solidarity is often along lines that we're not thrilled about. Um, it's not always easy to create uh, solidarity across lines of identity. Um, um, uh, one of the most exciting things to see in the world is the success of women cooperatives throughout the developing world in raising women out of poverty. That's great, but it means you're anchoring in the identity of women as women. You have to trade off in that case between actually serving the interests of this particularly weak um, um, population and achieving a more generalized uh, reciprocity between everyone without being based on solidarity groups. And I don't think there's a single one right answer. I think every cooperative has to commit to a certain ethical obligation that then it needs to defend to itself and to the outside world. Um, but sometimes building solidarity will mean having a particular group with its particular history and want, whether we think that's an attractive or an unattractive feature will largely depend on the nature of that identity. Mm -hmm. um, there's no single way of doing it for everyone um, uh, irrespective of who they are and what meaning their being in the world has as people who are worthy or not worthy of, of, of our respect as a, as a collective. So this will be the last question. <clears throat> We're almost out of time. Um, in that case, for, for you, does this look like something other than capitalism? Or are cooperatives just going to become incorporated into basically a capitalist economy? Or is there a possibility that they would move us into a different form of social relation? I think cooperatives provide a serious alternative to capitalism. If by capitalism we mean the basic idea that the means of production or organization production are owned by people who own the capital, and these people who own the capital are fundamentally different of people who provide the labor and people who use and consume the goods. Instead, if you have a model where control over the resources, negotiation and governance of how production happens, how distribution happens, what is responsible consumption is negotiated within a population of people, some of whom are providers, some of whom are users, many of whom are both. That's capitalism in the very minimal sense of it's a market economy. It's not a state-ordered economy. But it is a fundamentally different relation. It's a relation where production is social, where meaningful work and a decent living are the basic commitment more than shareholder value, which is not an independent value. And in this regard, it is a fundamental form of market society, certainly than the capitalism we have seen in, uh, over the last 40 years since the late 70s and 1980, which has been a much more extractive, much more unequal, and much more inhumane form of capitalism than uh, we are uh, able to uh, build together. Thank you so much for joining us today, Yohai Benkler. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.